Theodore Robert Bundy was an American serial killer who kidnapped, raped, and murdered numerous young women and girls during the 1970s and possibly earlier. After more than a decade of denials, he confessed to 30 homicides committed in seven states between 1974 and 1978. His true victim total is unknown, and believed by some investigators to be higher. Bundy was regarded as handsome and charismatic, traits that he exploited to win the trust of victims and society. He would typically approach his victims in public places, feigning injury or disability, or impersonating an authority figure, before knocking them unconscious and taking them to secluded locations to rape and strangle them. He sometimes revisited his victims, grooming and performing sexual acts with the decomposing corpses until putrefaction and destruction by wild animals made any further interactions impossible. There is no consensus on when or where Bundy began killing women. Some believe that he might have started killing as a teenager. Circumstantial evidence suggested that he may have abducted and killed eight-year-old Anne-Marie Burr Tacoma when he was 14 years old in 1961, an allegation that he repeatedly denied. His earliest documented homicides were committed in 1974 when he was 27 years old. By then, by his own admission, he had mastered the necessary skills, in the era before DNA profiling, to leave minimal incriminating forensic evidence at crime scenes. Shortly after midnight on January 4, 1974, Bundy entered the basement apartment of 18-year-old Karen Sparks, a dancer and student at UW. After bludgeoning Sparks senseless with a metal rod from her bed frame, he sexually assaulted her with either the same rod or a metal speculum, causing extensive internal injuries. She remained unconscious for 10 days, but survived with permanent physical and mental disabilities. In the early morning hours of February 1st, Bundy broke into the basement room of Linda Ann Healy, a UW undergraduate who broadcast morning radio weather reports for skiers. He beat her unconscious, dressed her in blue jeans, a white blouse, and boots, and carried her away. During the first half of 1974, female college students disappeared at the rate of about one per month. On March 12th, Donna Gail Manson, a 19-year-old student at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, 60 miles southwest of Seattle, left her dormitory to attend a jazz concert on campus but never arrived. On April 17, Susan Elaine Rancourt disappeared while on her way to her dorm room after an evening advisors meeting at Central Washington State College in Ellensburg, 110 miles southeast of Seattle. Two female Central Washington students later came forward to report encounters, one on the night of Rancourt's disappearance, the other three nights earlier, with a man wearing an arm sling, asking for help carrying a load of books to his brown or tan Volkswagen Beetle. On May 6, Roberta Kathleen Parks left her dormitory at Oregon State University in Corvallis, 260 miles south of Seattle, to have coffee with friends at the Memorial Union, but never arrived. Detectives from the King County and Seattle Police Departments grew increasingly concerned. There was no significant physical evidence, and the missing women had little in common, apart from being young, attractive, white college students with long hair parted in the middle. On June 1, Brenda Carroll Ball, aged 22, disappeared after leaving the Flame Tavern in Berrien, near Seattle-Tacoma International Airport. She was last seen in the parking lot, talking to a brown-haired man with his arm in a sling. In the early hours of June 11, UW student Georgian Hawkins vanished while walking down a brightly lit alley between her boyfriend's dormitory residence and her sorority house. The next morning, three Seattle homicide detectives and a criminalist combed the entire alleyway on their hands and knees, finding nothing. After Hawkins' disappearance was publicized, witnesses came forward to report seeing a man that night in an alley behind a nearby dormitory. He was on crutches with a leg cast and was struggling to carry a briefcase. One woman recalled that the man asked her to help him carry the case to his car, a light brown Volkswagen Beetle. Bundy later told Keppel that he lured Hawkins to his car before rendering her unconscious with a crowbar. He then handcuffed Hawkins and drove her to Issaquah, a suburb 20 miles east of Seattle, where he strangled her and spent the entire night with her body. Bundy said that Hawkins regained consciousness inside his car, and said she had a Spanish test the following day and she thought that I had taken her to help tutor her for the Spanish test. 
It's not funny, he added, but it's are the kinds of things people will say under those circumstances. He stated that he returned to the UW alley the morning after Hawkins' abduction and murder. There, in the very midst of a major crime scene investigation, he located and gathered Hawkins' earrings and one of her shoes, where he had left them in the adjoining parking lot, and departed, unobserved. He admitted to revisiting Hawkins' corpse on three occasions. During this period, Bundy was working in Olympia as the assistant director of the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Commission, where he wrote a pamphlet for women on rape prevention. Later, he worked at the Department of Emergency Services, DES, a state government agency involved in the search for the missing women. At DES he met and dated Carol Ann Boone, a twice-divorced mother of two who, six years later, would play an important role in the final phase of his life. Reports of the six missing women and Sparks' brutal beating appeared prominently in newspapers and on television throughout Washington and Oregon. Fear spread among the population, hitchhiking by young women dropped sharply. Pressure mounted on law enforcement agencies, but the paucity of physical evidence severely hampered them. Police could not provide reporters with the little information that was available for fear of compromising the investigation. Further similarities between the victims were noted. The disappearances all took place at night, usually near ongoing construction work, within a week of midterm or final exams, all of the victims were wearing slacks or blue jeans, and at most crime scenes, there were sightings of a man wearing a cast or a sling and driving a brown or tan Volkswagen Beetle. The Pacific Northwest murders culminated on July 14, with the broad daylight abductions of two women from a crowded beach at Lake Sammamish State Park in Issaquah. Five female witnesses described an attractive young man wearing a white tennis outfit with his left arm in a sling, speaking with a light accent, perhaps Canadian or British. Introducing himself as Ted, he asked their help in unloading a sailboat from his tan or bronze-colored Volkswagen Beetle. Four refused, one accompanied him as far as his car, saw that there was no sailboat, and fled. Three additional witnesses saw him approach Janice Annott, 23, a probation caseworker at the King County Juvenile Court, with the sailboat story and watched her leave the beach in his company. About four hours later, Denise Marie Naslund, a 19-year-old woman who was studying to become a computer programmer, left a picnic to go to the restroom and never returned. Bundy told both Stephen Michaud and William Hagmeyer that Ott was still alive when he returned with Naslund, and that he forced one to watch as he murdered the other, but he later denied it in an interview with Lewis on the eve of his execution. King County Police, finally armed with a detailed description of their suspect and his car, posted flyers throughout the Seattle area. A composite sketch was printed in regional newspapers and broadcast on local television stations. Elizabeth Klopfer, Anne Rule, a DES employee, and a UW psychology professor all recognized the profile, the sketch, and the car, and reported Bundy as a possible suspect, but detectives, who were receiving up to 200 tips per day, thought it unlikely that a clean-cut law student with no adult criminal record could be the perpetrator. On September 6, two grouse hunters stumbled across the skeletal remains of Otten Naslund near a service road in Issaquah, two miles east of Lake Sammamish State Park. An extra femur and several vertebrae found at the site were later identified by Bundy as those of Georgian Hawkins. Six months later, forestry students from Green River Community College discovered the skulls and mandibles of Healy, Rancourt, Parks, and Ball on Taylor Mountain, where Bundy frequently hiked, just east of Issaquah. Manson's remains were never recovered. In August 1974, Bundy received a second acceptance from the University of Utah Law School and moved to Salt Lake City, leaving Klopfer in Seattle. While he called Klopfer often, he dated, at least a dozen, other women. As he studied the first-year law curriculum a second time, he was devastated to find out that the other students had something, some intellectual capacity, that he did not. He found the classes completely incomprehensible. It was a great disappointment to me, he said. A new string of homicides began the following month, including two that would remain undiscovered until Bundy confessed to them shortly before his execution. On September 2, he raped and strangled a still unidentified hitchhiker in Idaho, then either disposed of the remains immediately in a nearby river or returned the next day to photograph and dismember the corpse. 
On October 2, he seized 16-year-old Nancy Wilcox in Holiday, a suburb of Salt Lake City. Her remains were buried near Capitol Reef National Park, some 200 miles south of Holiday, but were never found. On October 18, Melissa Ann Smith, the 17-year-old daughter of the police chief of Midvale, another Salt Lake City suburb, disappeared after leaving a pizza parlor. Her nude body was found in a nearby mountainous area nine days later. Post-mortem examination indicated that she may have remained alive for up to seven days following her disappearance. On October 31, Laura Ann Amy, also 17, disappeared 25 miles south in Lehi after leaving a cafe just after midnight. Her naked body was found by hikers nine miles to the northeast in American Fork Canyon on Thanksgiving Day. Both women had been beaten, raped, sodomized, and strangled with nylon stockings. Years later, Bundy described his post-mortem rituals with the corpses of Smith and Amy, including hair shampooing and application of makeup. In the late afternoon of November 8, Bundy approached 18-year-old telephone operator Carol Darrench at Fashion Place Mall in Murray, less than a mile from the Midvale restaurant where Melissa Smith was last seen. He identified himself as Officer Roseland, of the Murray Police Department and told Darrench that someone had attempted to break into her car. He asked her to accompany him to the station to file a complaint. When Darrench pointed out to Bundy that he was driving on a road that did not lead to the police station, he immediately pulled onto the shoulder and attempted to handcuff her. During their struggle, he inadvertently fastened both handcuffs to the same wrist, and Darrench was able to open the car door and escape. Later that evening, Deborah Jean Kent, a 17-year-old student at Beaumont High School in Bountiful, 20 miles north of Murray, disappeared after leaving a theatre production at the school to pick up her brother. The school's drama teacher and a student told police that, a stranger, had asked each of them to come out to the parking lot to identify a car. Another student later saw the same man pacing in the rear of the auditorium, and the drama teacher spotted him again shortly before the end of the play. Outside the auditorium, investigators found a key that unlocked the handcuffs removed from Carol Darrench's wrist. In November, Elizabeth Klopfer called King County Police a second time after reading that young women were disappearing in towns surrounding Salt Lake City. Detective Randy Hergesheimer of the Major Crimes Division interviewed her in detail. By then, Bundy had risen considerably on the King County hierarchy of suspicion, but the Lake Sammamish witness considered most reliable by detectives failed to identify him from a photo lineup. In December, Klopfer called the Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office and repeated her suspicions. Bundy's name was added to their list of suspects, but at that time no credible forensic evidence linked him to the Utah crimes. In January 1975, Bundy returned to Seattle after his final exams and spent a week with Klopfer, who did not tell him that she had reported him to police on three occasions. She made plans to visit him in Salt Lake City in August. In 1975, Bundy shifted much of his criminal activity eastward, from his base in Utah to Colorado. On January 12, a 23-year-old registered nurse named Karen Eileen Campbell disappeared while walking down a well-lit hallway between the elevator and her room at the Wildwood Inn, now the Wildwood Lodge, in Snowmass Village, 400 miles southeast of Salt Lake City. Her nude body was found a month later next to a dirt road just outside the resort. She had been killed by blows to her head from a blunt instrument that left distinctive linear groove depressions on her skull. Her body also bore deep cuts from a sharp weapon. On March 15, 100 miles northeast of Snowmass, Vail ski instructor Julie Cunningham, 26, disappeared while walking from her apartment to a dinner date with a friend. Bundy later told Colorado investigators that he approached Cunningham on crutches and asked her to help carry his ski boots to his car, where he clubbed and handcuffed her, then assaulted and strangled her at a secondary site near Rifle, 90 miles west of Vail. Weeks later, he made the six-hour drive from Salt Lake City to revisit her remains. Denise Lynn Oliverson, age 25, disappeared near the Utah-Colorado border in Grand Junction on April 6 while riding her bicycle to her parents' house. Her bike and sandals were found under a viaduct near a railroad bridge. On May 6, Bundy lured 12-year-old Lynette Dawn Culver from Alameda Junior High School in Pocatello, Idaho, 160 miles north of Salt Lake City. 
He drowned and then sexually assaulted her in his hotel room, before disposing of her body in a river possibly the snake north of Pocatello. On June 28, Susan Curtis vanished from the campus of Brigham Young University in Provo, 45 miles south of Salt Lake City. Curtis's murder became Bundy's last confession, tape recorded moments before he entered the execution chamber. The bodies of Wilcox, Kent, Cunningham, Oliverson, Culver, and Curtis were never recovered. From Chicago, Bundy traveled by train to Ann Arbor, Michigan, in the early hours of January 15, 1978, one week after his arrival in Tallahassee, Bundy entered FSU's Chiamega sorority house through a rear door with a faulty locking mechanism. Beginning at about 2.45 a.m., he bludgeoned Margaret Bowman, 21, with a piece of oak firewood as she slept, then garroted her with a nylon stocking. He then entered the bedroom of 20-year-old Lisa Levy and beat her unconscious, strangled her, tore one of her nipples, bit deeply into her left buttock, and sexually assaulted her with a hair mist bottle. In an adjoining bedroom he attacked Kathy Kleiner, breaking her jaw and deeply lacerating her shoulder, and Karen Chandler, who suffered a concussion, broken jaw, loss of teeth, and a crushed finger. Chandler and Kleiner survived the attack. Kleiner attributed their survival to automobile headlights illuminating the interior of their room and frightening away the attacker. Tallahassee detectives determined that the four attacks took place in a total of less than 15 minutes, within earshot of more than 30 witnesses who heard nothing. After leaving the sorority house, Bundy broke into a basement apartment eight blocks away and attacked FSU student Cheryl Thomas, dislocating her shoulder and fracturing her jaw and skull in five places. She was left with permanent deafness, and equilibrium damage that ended her dance career. On Thomas's bed, police found a semen stain and a pantyhose, mask, containing two hairs, similar to Bundy's in class and characteristic. On February 8, Bundy drove 150 miles east to Jacksonville, in a stolen FSU van. In a parking lot he approached 14-year-old Leslie Parmenter, the daughter of Jacksonville Police Department's chief of detectives, identifying himself as Richard Burton, fire department, but retreated when Parmenter's older brother arrived and challenged him. That afternoon, he backtracked 60 miles westward to Lake City. At Lake City Junior High School the following morning, 12-year-old Kimberly Diane Leach was summoned to her homeroom by a teacher to retrieve a forgotten purse, she never returned to class. Seven weeks later, after an intensive search, her partially mummified remains were found in a pig farrowing shed near Suwannee River State Park, 35 miles 56 kilometers northwest of Lake City. She appeared to have been raped, then killed by neck lacerations with a knife. On February 12, with insufficient cash to pay his overdue rent and a growing suspicion that police were closing in on him, Bundy stole a car and fled Tallahassee, driving westward across the Florida Panhandle. Three days later, at around 1 a.m., he was stopped by Pensacola police officer David Lee near the Alabama state line after a wants and warrants check showed his Volkswagen Beetle was stolen. When told he was under arrest, Bundy kicked Lee's legs out from under him and took off running. Lee fired a warning shot followed by a second round, gave chase and tackled him. The two struggled over Lee's gun before the officer finally subdued and arrested Bundy. In the stolen vehicle were three sets of IDs belonging to female FSU students, 21 stolen credit cards and a stolen television set. Also found were a pair of dark-rimmed non-prescription glasses and a pair of plaid slacks, later identified as the disguise worn by Richard Burton, Fire Department, in Jacksonville. As Lee transported his suspect to jail, unaware that he had just arrested one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives, he heard Bundy say, I wish you had killed me. Following a change of venue to Miami, Bundy stood trial for the Chiamega homicides and assaults in June 1979. The trial was covered by 250 reporters from five continents and was the first to be televised nationally in the United States. Despite the presence of five court-appointed attorneys, Bundy again handled much of his own defense. From the beginning, he sabotaged the entire defense effort out of spite, distrust, and grandiose delusion, Nelson later wrote. Ted was facing murder charges, with a possible death sentence, and all that mattered to him apparently was that he be in charge. Six months later, a second trial took place in Orlando, 
for the abduction and murder of Kimberly Leach. Bundy was found guilty once again, after less than eight hours' deliberation, due principally to the testimony of an eyewitness who saw him leading Leach from the schoolyard to his stolen van. Important material evidence included clothing fibers with an unusual manufacturing error, found in the van and on Leach's body, which matched fibers from the jacket Bundy was wearing when he was arrested. During the penalty phase of the trial, Bundy took advantage of an obscure Florida law providing that a marriage declaration in court, in the presence of a judge, constituted a legal marriage. As he was questioning former Washington State DES co-worker Carol Ann Boone, who had moved to Florida to be near Bundy, had testified on his behalf during both trials, and was again testifying on his behalf as a character witness, he asked her to marry him. She accepted, and Bundy declared to the court that they were legally married. On February 10, 1980, Bundy was sentenced for a third time to death by electrocution. As the sentence was announced, he reportedly stood and shouted, tell the jury they were wrong. This third death sentence would be the one ultimately carried out nearly nine years later. In October 1981, Boone gave birth to a daughter and named Bundy as the father. While conjugal visits were not allowed at Rayford Prison, inmates were known to pool their money in order to bribe guards to allow them intimate time alone with their female visitors. Shortly after the conclusion of the Leach trial and the beginning of the long appeals process that followed, Bundy initiated a series of interviews with Stephen Michaud and Hugh Ainsworth. Speaking mostly in third person to avoid the stigma of confession, he began for the first time to divulge details of his crimes and thought processes. He recounted his career as a thief, confirming Klopfer's longtime suspicion that he had shoplifted virtually everything of substance that he owned. The big payoff for me, he said, was actually possessing whatever it was I had stolen. I really enjoyed having something that I had wanted and gone out and taken. Possession proved to be an important motive for rape and murder as well. Sexual assault, he said, fulfilled his need to totally possess his victims. At first, he killed his victims, as a matter of expediency, to eliminate the possibility of being caught, but later, murder became part of the adventure. The ultimate possession was, in fact, the taking of the life, he said. And then, the physical possession of the remains. In early 1986, an execution date, March 4, was set on the Chiamega convictions. The Supreme Court issued a brief stay, but the execution was quickly rescheduled. In April, shortly after the new date, July 2, was announced, Bundy finally confessed to Hagmeyer and Nelson what they believed was the full range of his depredations, including details of what he did to some of his victims after their deaths. He told them that he revisited Taylor Mountain, Issaquah, and other secondary crime scenes often several times, to lie with his victims and perform sexual acts with the decomposing bodies until putrefaction forced him to stop. In some cases, he drove for several hours each way and remained the entire night. In Utah, he applied makeup to Melissa Smith's lifeless face, and he repeatedly washed Laura Imes' hair. If you've got time, he told Hagmeyer, they can be anything you want them to be. He decapitated approximately 12 of his victims with a hacksaw, and kept at least one group of severed heads, probably the four later found on Taylor Mountain, Rancourt, Parks, Ball and Healy, in his apartment for a period of time before disposing of them. With all appeal avenues exhausted and no further motivation to deny his crimes, Bundy agreed to speak frankly with investigators. He confessed to Keppel that he had committed all eight of the Washington and Oregon homicides for which he was the prime suspect. Bundy died in the Rayford electric chair at 7.16 a.m. on January 24, 1989. Hundreds of revelers sang, danced and set off fireworks in a pasture across from the prison as the execution was carried out, then cheered as the white hearse containing Bundy's corpse departed the prison. He was cremated in Gainesville, and his ashes scattered at an undisclosed location in the Cascade Range of Washington State, in accordance with his will. Thanks for watching. For more videos please click like and subscribe.